my name is Ismael Trevino and this is the Millennial Way Show directly from Lisbon, Portugal in the Web Summit 2018. Our next guest, well, she is fascinating. She's a filmmaker, she's an explorer, and also she's an environmental activist. Her name is Alexandra Cousteau and is the granddaughter of the legendary Jacques Cousteau. This is the interview. Alexandra, thank you very much for being with us. It's my pleasure. Before we start to talk about the summit and the reason that you are, why you're here today, let's talk about your passion. I understand that you're so passionate about oceans, about water. Tell us about why. Why is that passion and, and, and why did you start uh, from the, when you were seven years old, in the, having you, your, with your hands, with your grandfather, to talk and experience this passion about the oceans and also the water? Well, my family taught me to swim actually before I could walk. So I've always felt really comfortable in the water and swimming and being underwater. My grandfather taught me to scuba dive when I was seven. And that opened up a whole new world for me. Scuba dive with the whole, with yep. the whole kid and stuff? Yep. Wow. Yep. And uh, that was really a transformational experience. I was, I was able finally to understand what the big deal was all about. You know, growing up in this family with um, these films about oceans and everything was one thing, but actually experiencing it for myself was entirely another. And it, it just set the stage for me to really just dedicate the rest of my life to it. You, saw, you, you had the opportunity to see the, the oceans of the 50s. Of the ocean of the 60s, well, the experience that your grandfather told you I about didn't it. I see the ocean <laughs> of the 50s, let's be clear. <laughs> I mean, do you have the experience of, of sharing those stories that your grandfather uh, told you about the ocean of the 50s and the 60s? Now you have the opportunity to see the ocean of today's. Uh, it's a totally different picture, am I correct? Absolutely. You know, when my grandfather started exploring the ocean and making films about it, films that inspired the entire world to feel awe and wonder for what was under the surface, which nobody had ever seen before. And it's hard today to imagine that. Just you know, 60 years ago, people didn't know what was in the ocean. So I think the, the gift that my grandfather gave the world were those images and, and the opportunity for people to start appreciating uh, all of the life and the wonder that, uh, that is in our ocean. As time went on, though, um, because the oceans that he explored were pristine, they were pristine and abundant and clean. Um, my father, starting in the 60s, was noticing that there were changes happening, and, and changes due to pollution and overfishing and things that were really alarming. And he started talking about the idea of conserving what we have so that we don't lose it, the conservation ethic that has carried us forward and allowed us to protect a lot of important places and uh, stop degradation and have important conversations with each other throughout different stakeholder groups and throughout different industries about how we protect what we have. But the truth is that in my lifetime, the past 40 years, we have lost more of our oceans than ever before in human history, even as we've learned more about them. How, how is that? Uh, overfishing and pollution, um, extraction, I mean, you name it, it's happening. And now we have the added pressures of uh, climate change and ocean acidification. But how, how, how we understand that having all this technology and having all this data and having all this scientific proof, uh, and we continue to that path? That's right, we do. It's, um, Part of it is that we have a very short-term mentality in our, in our societies. You know, politicians are on a two or four or five year cycle, so they're really looking ahead just a few years at getting reelected. And industry, they have yearly reporting cycles to their shareholders that is focused entirely on profit. Um, and just your average citizen and consumer is thinking about getting food on the table and getting the kids to school and, you know, saving some money and none of us are really thinking ahead into the future into what is the vision of the future that will be abundant and will be um, a place that it allows us to thrive and be healthy and happy and prosperous 
And we forget that the environment is the foundation for all of that. And so we make these short-term sacrifices, and those add up. And that's what we're seeing today. And we have climate change and ocean acidification, which are trends that um, could really spell game over for the oceans in a number of decades. And so I think what we need to think about today and what our generation, or at least my generation of this family, um, needs to focus on, on talking about with people is that conservation is no longer enough. Just protecting what's left is insufficient to be able to ensure an abundant environment for our future needs. Um, so what we need to do is rebuild abundance, restore abundance. And that is, is a very different approach than conservation. But I think one that is our greatest hope for taking us into the future that we want. And I would have to say that um, all is not lost. You know, there, people often ask me, well, do you feel optimistic or do you feel pessimistic about the future? And I would say, I, I you know, optimism. I have that question <laughs> right here. Question. <laughs> I, I, felt, I felt it coming. Yeah. Well, optimism is something, it, it's an emotion that allows you to sit back and say, I'm an optimist, everything will be fine. Right? And, and a pessimist sits back and says, well, we're all screwed, so what can I do about that? And I think what we need to focus on is active hope. This idea that there is reason for hope, there, are, there is um, new solutions and innovations and ideas and technologies that can help us bridge that ingenuity gap. That is the leap we have to make to start restoring abundance to our, to our ocean and, and our, our planet. Um, and in order to, to ignite that hope, we have to be active. Active hope, that's a, that's a very interesting um, term. Alexander, we saw this um, gigantic um, island of plastic near the Costa Rica. We've seen all these uh, huge marks in the ocean uh, in Japan, also in California. Um, and you mentioned a very important topic of, of awareness about, well, climate change and global warming. Um, is this something that we have to leave it to the politicians or how us as a community can we also, you know, like contribute to, to reduce or to be uh, activists, positive activists in, in these terms? I think that we are watching our society change, right? We're, we're, the old way of doing things is no longer the way we're doing things now. I mean, um, electric cars, the sharing economy, there's you know things like Uber and, and people don't need to own things as much anymore. We can share things and that's just one example of the way our society is changing and I think changing for the better. Um, so I, I, I believe that it's it's very much obviously in the hands of industry and government to do the right thing but we are consumers and we are citizens and we have influence on both of those stakeholder groups. So what we do, who we vote for, what we buy, how we live, um, the transportation that we choose, the, the kinds of new technologies that we embrace, the ideas that we share with one another and, and the, the, what we choose to share on social media, all of this is really important and, and I think that we will shape the future. We'll either shape it through inaction or we will shape it through active hope. And, and I think that um, once we realize that we'll never go back to the world the way it was, but we can shape a future that is one that is worth living in and one that is worth passing on to our children, that's something to get up for in the morning. And it's something that has purpose and meaning and, and requires all of our um, participation. Positive activism. So. Tell us about your latest projects. Well, what are you right now on? We are um, looking at um, an initiative that we've called Oceans 2050. Um, you know, there's there's uh, the prediction that I think hasn't escaped anyone's notice that by 2050 there'll be more plastic in the oceans than fish. Um, and I have to say, I, I think that the plastic issue which is galvanizing so many people and, and engaging them and pushing them to action could be the turning point for our oceans. You know, we saw this in the 60s and 70s with the whales. The whales were getting hunted, they were getting killed, it was a horrible thing. People around the world really took action to save the whales. 
thanks to Greenpeace and other organizations, thanks to governments that wrote new legislation, we changed the outcome for whales. And whales um, are coming back now. Yeah. And, and we live in a world with more whales in it than we did 30 years ago. That's an extraordinary thing. Wow, that's and, and it's, amazing. I think, the, the first big success that we had. Because it marked a moment when um, people who had never seen a whale, who likely would never see a whale, but recognized their desire to live in a world that they could share with whales, just sharing the planet with them. And they took action for that. And I think that is what we could see with plastic, that, that plastic is something that we're seeing on our beaches and we're seeing in our kitchens. And we don't want what's in our kitchens to end up on our beaches. And so it is a very direct causal relationship between our use of plastic and the plastic we see in the environment, choking turtles and entangling whales and all of that, and may be the thing that creates the shift that we need to understand that the ocean is really downstream from each and every one of us. So how you could, how it consists the, the, the project? Eliminate plastic from, from the, well, the, the plastic human usage? Is a, is a big problem. You know, there is essential plastic, plastic that we use for medical devices and other things. Um, plastic that could be used for for building homes and and um, could be in a perpetually uh, or is more like the daily recycled, uses exactly. like bottles and things like that. Single-use plastic is the biggest problem, and and that has got to go. So I think the the solution to that is going to be partially recycling, but we will make a huge mistake if we focus only on recycling. We also need to ban single-use plastic. We need to. Um, buy products and demand our favorite brands give us alternatives to single-use plastic. Uh, we need our governments to, uh, like, I, I believe we'll have a big announcement from the government of Portugal today. Um, I'll be on stage with the minister when he makes that announcement about what Portugal is doing about single-use plastics, and I'm really excited to find out. So I think it's going to be a mixture of all of that, banning it, alternatives, recycling, cleaning up what's there, um, but we can't just focus on one of those solutions because it's insufficient. Uh, Alexander, can you please elaborate on this uh, Ocean 2050 initiative, please? So Oceans 2050 is really about imagining that different future for our oceans so that by the time we get to 2050, we don't have more plastic than fish in the ocean and we don't have an overly acidic ocean that makes it impossible for fish to thrive and for fisheries to thrive and all of that. So. What we're doing is we are in investing in ocean afforestation, kelp and seagrass and corals and mangroves and all of the industries that come from that so that we can have a more abundant ocean in the future. Last question, and I really appreciate your time. If there's one big advice that you receive from your grandfather, Mr. Jacques Cousteau, the legendary Jacques Cousteau, that you can share to all these new generations of activists, of environmentalists, of um, explorers of the oceans that you would like to, to share with them, which will be that uh, advice? My grandfather often said that people protect what they love and they love what they know. And when I was a little girl asking him countless questions about every possible thing that I could think of, uh, he would always answer questions and then get tired of answering questions. And finally he'd say to me, you know, Alexandra, it's time for you to go and see for yourself. And that was the best advice he gave me because it pushed me out into the world to experience things and places and ideas and people. And that shaped how I understand not just the world around me, but also my place in it. And so I would encourage young people today to go and see for yourselves and never be shy about exploring things that are new to you and forming your own ideas about things and, and how the world should be and find your place in this wave of change that's coming because we need each and every one of you to be part of that. Alexandra Cousteau, the granddaughter of Jacques Cousteau, here with us on the Millennial Way Show. Alexandra, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. That's great. We are stewards of this kingdom. We need to use all our resources to learn everything about the state of our ocean. We need to understand it and do everything we can to take care of it.
Can you imagine the ocean without fish? Well, we hope you like this interview with Alexander Cousteau. If you like it, please give us some love, give us some share, give us some comments right here. And from the Tejo River in Lisbon, Portugal, this is the Millennial Way Show, empowering the new generations.